Hello. Welcome to the first installment of our three-part series on Brooklyn Resist Education as Activism. My name is Shirley brown Aline, and I'm the Manager of Education at Brooklyn Public Library Center for Brooklyn History. Today, I'm joined by fellow colleagues from of the education team at CBH, as well as Dr. Brian Purnell, the curator and historian of the Brooklyn Resist Exhibition, and from Facing History in Ourselves, New York, Katie Leo, Program Associate, and Renee Halston, Program Specialist. I'd like to commence the official proceedings of today's sessions by acknowledging that the Center for Brooklyn History stands on land that is part of the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lene Lenape Delaware people. As a sign of respect, we recognize and honor the Lene Lenape Delaware nations, their elders past and present and future generations. We are committed to addressing exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples and confronting the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism in our work. So let's get to know each other. What we're going to do is we're going to screen and we're going to ask if you can answer. If outside the New York City area where you're coming from, the question is where are you joining? And it looks like we got a poll with all the questions at once. So as you can see, we've got a, uh, where are you joining us from? What grade level you teach? Uh, what subjects you teach? And if you have experience teaching the civil rights movement in your classroom. Um, okay, we've, so. We've launched all at once. Complete the whole poll, that would be great. All right, let's see. Okay, so it looks like the majority of the participants are coming from Brooklyn. We also have some participants from Manhattan, as well as participants from outside the tri-state area. We also have primary, it looks like we have a lot of elementary school teachers, along with high school teachers, museum and cultural institutions and others. We also have a middle school teacher, yay. As far as subjects that you teach, we have predominantly history, social studies teachers, ELA teachers. We have teachers who teach both history and ELA. We also have teachers who teach others. And oh, the good question: Have you taught Have you taught students about the civil rights movement before? Andy, but overwhelmingly, yes. One person said no. But that's that's cool. Thank you so much for well, our agenda today. As you can see, we're beginning with a welcome and overview by me. Then approximately 4.05, for you know, a little bit after that, um, we'll begin with Dr. And then soon after we'll have Q&A with Dr. Brian Pinnell. Then right after that, we'll have a presentation from Facing History and Ourselves along with an activity. And then approximately 525, we'll have wrap up surveys and CTLE credits. Okay. So, um, a couple of things to get before we get started. I'd like to share some housekeeping instructions and review the code of conduct for today's session. First, if you haven't done so already, please add your name and, pro and pronouns to your profile. You can do this by clicking on the participants icon at the bottom of the window, find and hover your name in the participants list on the right side of the Zoom and click more, and then you click rename from the options provided. You can now edit your name and add pronouns. For, for example, they, them, she, her, he, him. You'll notice that we've, muted, that we've muted all participants in order to prevent unintentional audio feedback and disruptions during the program. 
Therefore, we strongly encourage you to use Zoom's chat feature to share your ideas, comments, and questions. Staff will closely monitor the chat and be on hand to provide technical assistance, offer clarification, and or respond to concerns. They'll also use chat feature to share resources referenced in the presentation and collate questions for the Q&A portion of today's session. You can access the chat feature by clicking on the chat icon on the bottom of your window. There will be opportunities for Q&A during which you can raise the hand icon to share a question with our speakers directly. We are committed to ensuring all our events, activities, and materials are accessible to all individuals, including individuals with disabilities. Therefore, captioning is available during today's session and can be enabled by clicking on the CC closed caption icon at the bottom of your window. Please email our staff if you if your preferred communication method at connections at BKLNY, bklynlibrary.org if you require other accessibility accommodations. Lastly, we want you to be aware that this session is being recorded and will be shared after the session concludes. By participating with your camera on, you have consented to being recorded. If you do not consent to being recorded, please turn your camera off and refrain from verbally sharing ideas, comments, and questions. You can share these through the chat feature, which will not be saved. Breakout sessions will also not be recorded. Code of conduct. Our events are intended to create a space that nurtures a, com a community of educators that is inclusive of all, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender identity, religion, age, sexual orientation, ability, or stage of professional development. All attendees are expected to show respect to presenters, organizers, and other attendees. This event contains, this event will contain discussion about issues related to race, bias, and oppression that can be difficult to talk about. As an attendee, we may at time, you may at times feel uncomfortable with the issues and opinions shared. If you find yourself struggling with the topic of discussion, it is appropriate to walk away from your computer and take a break. It is not appropriate to respond by sharing hateful ideologies, racist language, or confrontational viewpoints. Hateful and racist behavior will be considered a violation of the code of conduct and result in immediate expulsion from the event. We ask you to, act, to actively listen, be sensitive to the anxieties and concerns of your fellow participants and show support for one another. Again, please reach out if you need help. Use the chat feature if you have a technology issue, want to clarify something or have concerns about another participant's behavior. You can also privately message staff through the chat feature if your concern is sensitive. Find us by looking for the word co-host beside, beside our names in the participant list. During each presentation, please feel free to add questions to the chat. During the, during the Q&A session, section, we will have our presenters answer them. Now, I would like to introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Brian Cornell. Oh, I'm sorry. I did fail to mention that this um, workshop is humbly being supported by many funders, including the Rudin Foundation, the Na um, National Grid Foundation, Jennifer and Steven Eisenstadt, Blake and Andrew Foote, Audra and Robin Ottaway, Nicole and Timothy Simmons, donors to the fund for CBH, the Double R Foundation, the Malka Fund, White Cedar Fund, New York City Cultural Affairs, and New York State Council for the Arts. Now, Ryan Purnell, who I am so excited to actually introduce this man. He is a wonderful, wonderful author of Fighting Jim Crow in the County of Kings, the Congress of Racial Equality in Brooklyn, which actually won the New York State Historical Association's Dixon Ryan Fox Manuscript Prize and the co-editor of The Strange Careers of the Jim Crow North, Segregation and Struggle Outside of the South. He, is, he was the lead historian for the Center for Brooklyn's History Public History Exhibit, Brooklyn Resists. His research, writing, and teaching areas generally fall within the broad field of US history, 
with specific concentrations in African-American history, urban history, and civil rights and Black power movement. Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, Purnell has called Brunswick, Maine his home since 2010. A scholar and public historian of New York City, he is currently editing a series of oral history interviews he conducted with the late activist educator Jitu Wisu, I hope I said that correctly, for a book entitled The Narrative of Jitu Wisu, Brooklyn's Black Power Educator. He is also a com he's also completing a history of Brooklyn for the great courses Amazon Audible Digital Black Digital Platform. Phew. Lastly, Purnell is working on a longer term project, a narrative history called Black People and the Making of Gotham and African American History of New York City. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Brian Purnell. Thank you so, so much. Everyone can hear me. Yeah. I'm going to try to go for 16 minutes. So I'm setting my timer. So what does it mean for children to have a first class education? More or less, that's the subject of my brief overview. And I think that that's the most important question that's at the heart of the education as activism portion of the Brooklyn Resists exhibit. Um, some other questions that have to do with the history of what does it mean to have a first class education regard the role of, of race and class. How do race and class play into the way that we, we answer that question about a first class education? Briefly, uh, I just want to share a little bit about, oh my goodness, I'm so out, I'm out of practice with Zoom. Uh, you got to bear with me for one second. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Um, I wanted to just um, uh, share a little bit about the Brooklyn Resists exhibit. Not a lot, though, um, because you can go to it yourself and you're going to spend time with it over the next few workshops. But everybody can see the Brooklyn Resists uh, web page up. Thank you so much, uh, Katie. Um, this is an exhibit that the Center for Brooklyn History and the Brooklyn Public Library uh, launched at the end of 2020. We started the research then. And really, with all the information that we put together and that we presented, there's just a couple of central ideas that I want to put into your consciousness while, while you learn from the exhibit and, and use it as an educator. Um, Racism persists and Brooklyn resists. Black lives matter, right? These are kind of the three main ideas that animated this exhibit's presentation of history over the course of about 400 years in, of Brooklyn's history. Um, it's the same song sung to a different tune. How has racism persisted and how has Brooklyn resisted? over the course of its entire history. And probably most important to the work that we did on the exhibit is how do you put Black people at the center and how do you put questions of resistance at the center of a study of the history of racism and resistance? So that's the exhibit. Um, there's a lot of themes that we pulled out, I should say, we were very conscious about thinking about our time period, about the, the present, about George Floyd, about Breonna Taylor, about Trayvon Martin, about Black Lives Matter, about the protests and the uprisings that were occurring in Brooklyn and uh, in, in, in around the country uh, in 2020 and going back to 2014. We were very conscious about wanting to have a conversation between the past and the present. Um, and that's, that's very much a part of this exhibit um, and what this exhibit says about the persistence of racism and the persistence of resistance. So one of the themes that we extrapolate, that we worked on had to do with education as activism. And Education as activism really 
the concentrates on two different parts of uh, the education piece. There's the education itself, there's learning and learning as a form of activism. Um, and then there is the issue of schools, schools as a site of politics and culture and citizenship and struggle, right? Those are two different sides of the same coin regarding the history of education as activism. And what the exhibit does is it highlights different moments, um, some from the late ninth, the mid 19th century, the mid 1800s uh, in the independent community of Weeksville um, and how Weeksville, the black people in Weeksville uh, prioritized education. They founded uh, independent schools uh, for black children in Weeksville. Um, those also, by the way, were some of the first uh, racially integrated schools uh, in Brooklyn uh, in the 19th century. So education, um, learning, um, a, a, an essential component for African-Americans in Brooklyn to advance uh, their pursuit of citizenship and their resistance against racism during their times. But schools themselves, right? Actu the actual institution of the school itself is also a racism. And we, we can see this play out throughout much of the 20th century and into our current day. And it's, it's that history that I wanted to talk about ever so briefly, if you'll indulge me, the, 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 the disrespectful attempt to try to talk in 10 minutes about just one slice of education as activism in the 1960s. So um, here you see uh, an image from the 1964 citywide school boycott um, of New York City public schools, which in, in some ways is, is certainly one of, some might say the uh, largest form of nonviolent civil disobedience in the civil rights movement. I mean, just think about that for a second. One of the largest protests against racial discrimination, one of the largest protests for desegregation of public schools occurred in New York City in 1964. Over 400 thousand students stayed out of school to honor a one day boycott to protest racial segregation uh, in the schools. And I had some questions here that I wanted you to think about. I, I was going to play an interview with one of the leaders of that demonstration, a man named the Reverend Milton Galamison. You'll see his name appear in the Brooklyn Resists exhibit. Reverend Galamison was the pastor of Siloam Presbyterian Church, um, a very long and proud tradition of African-American um, uh, Presbyterianism in Brooklyn going back to the 1840s. And there was a clip from 1964 after the boycott where Reverend Galamison is talking to Robert Penn Warren, who was a poet and author at the time, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat when I finish talking. So you can maybe listen to this yourself. And I'll also share these slides um, with Shirley and she could share them with all of you. But anyway, just to condense this down a bit, um, Robert Penn Warren and Reverend Galamison are talking about integration. And Robert Penn Warren says to Reverend Galamison, you know, don't you think that this integration thing might become kind of a distraction. He calls it a shibboleth. Now I had to look up the word shibboleth. I'm, I'm not a walking dictionary. And, and, and a shibboleth, <laughs> it's kind of a fun word. You could teach it to your students. A shibboleth is a, a term that's associated with one group of people and their customs and their traditions. And, and, and those customs and traditions have become 
um, outdated and not useful. So while Robert Penn Warren is saying to Glamis, and listen, this whole racial integration thing that you're talking about in Brooklyn, don't you worry about that becoming, you know, kind of a fad, a shibboleth? Shouldn't we really be talking about equality? Now, I love that question in some ways because there's always this tension, right, between, you know, what Black people kind of want to do and the ways that we are talking about our freedom, liberation, civil rights. And then there's kind of the public conversation that's going on in the background saying, how come you're talking about integration, you really should be talking about equality. That's kind of what's going on in this question. Like, how come you're talking about Black Lives Matter? You really should be talking about all lives matter, right? Same song, different tune. What I like about this so much is the way that Galamison responds. And, and I won't read all of it, um, 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 but some of the, some of the uh, key points are this. Galamison comes and defines integration as saying that um, integration, and this is 1964, integration is the road to equality. The, the, the best part, I think, uh, is, is when Galamison says, and it's in red, short of integration, the American Negro, Black people, African Americans, have no equality. Short of, and he's using, you know, male gendered language, but short, I'm gonna, I'm gonna paraphrase a bit. Short of Black people's participation in mainstream American life, in terms of the same education, in terms of the same kind of housing, in terms of the same kind of employment, there can't be any kind of equality. So, this is a great conversation to kind of get into the mindset about what education as activism looked like in the 1960s during the civil rights movement in Brooklyn, New York, when African Americans and their allies, that's another theme of the Brooklyn Resists exhibit. I hope you check it out. I hope you get into that exhibit on alliances and allyship. It's very important, right? During the civil rights movement, African-Americans in Brooklyn and in New York City and their allies were really pushing questions about integration as a means of forcing the issue for equitable education for everyone, especially for black students and black children, um, but for everybody. So these are some questions that I usually try to get at in this presentation. Um, I always, I mean, you know, I'm a teacher too, right? So I always start with the question, right? Like, are, are New York City schools segregated by race and class, right? Like, why? Like, I don't, I don't start with the assumption like this is segregated, and 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 now we need to talk about that. Let's let's go back one step. Like, let's ask the question: Is it segregated by race and class? Well, how did that happen, and why, right? And what are the effects of that? I like to get into the de jure, de facto distinction, but I don't think I'll have a lot of time to do that today. Um, and then I always, what would it take to make racial integration, right? The ways that Galamison was talking about it, what would it take to make that happen um, in the past and in the present? Now, let me just do a little bit of, very little bit about uh, segregation and inequality in a place like New York City. I can't help it. I know I don't have time to do this, but you know, we're teachers, I can't help myself. Does anybody know what this source is, what this map is? Can you unmute and, or I don't know, raise your hand or just, just unmute and if you know what it is or write it in the chat, like, what is this? Does anyone know? Getting a lot of people saying redlining in the chat. Oh, they're saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm not even checking the chat. That's how unzoomed out I am. I'm not checking the chat. Yeah, this is a redlining map. In short, what do redlining maps show? Redlining maps show how during the 1930s and 40s, some areas became desirable places for investment in development, and some areas became what the maps called hazardous places for investment and development. The red areas were considered the most hazardous, 
The green areas were considered the safest areas for development. The blue areas were also really, really good. And the yellow areas were kind of cautionary areas. Now, these maps don't necessarily indicate that Black people had to live in certain places and white people had to live in other places. But what these maps did and what the research that created these maps did is they specifically identified every single area that had almost an insignificant amount of Black people living in them. And all of those areas are redlined. This is for every metropolitan area in the country. So the surest way for an area to get redlined is to have Black people living in it. There's other ways you could get redlined, and there's other kinds of people who are living in redlined area. But a universal practice creating these maps is that if you're Black, step back. So again, what that means is, again, these areas in red are areas where investment dollars went away from, and the areas that aren't in red are where investment dollars flowed to. You combine this with practices of racial segregation within the housing market, and that's how you get the disproportionate concentration of Black people in a handful of residential areas. Now, what does this mean for public schools? Unfortunately, this may be where I have to cut off the substance because I don't want to disrespect you know, my other fellow presenters and cut into their time. What this means for public schools is this. Again, this 1939. 20 years later, what we see are the utilization of schools throughout Brooklyn. And you can see very clear overutilization in certain areas and underutilization in other areas. Wherever on these maps you see dark, dark red, you're talking about 150 percent overutilization of the public schools. That's a fancy way of saying that these schools were way overcrowded. And wherever you see dark green, that means they had seats in those schools. So I'm just gonna scroll through. This is Brooklyn 1959. Already coming down from Greenpoint into Williamsburg, we're gonna come down to the east side of Prospect Park. You could already see a lot of dark red in what we know of as central Brooklyn, right? What we know of as Bedford-Stuyvesant, Northern Crown Heights, Ocean Hill, Brownsville, going into East New York. These were the areas that were redlined. These were the areas where residential segregated segregation funneled uh, Black people, where they were the only places where they could live. The places that are green, and then the places that are gray are places that are like 100% capacity, right? Like they're just schools that, you know, they're flowing just fine. So what we see is to utilize spaces in places that are unpopulated. And we see that there's a lot of overutilized spaces in places that are overcrowded. Going now more to the west of Brooklyn in the Bay Ridge area, which if you remember from the red line map, I didn't point it out, Bay Ridge was the only area that got the green light. And now we see that over down in Southwestern Brooklyn, <laughs> fancy that, those areas of school have some of the least utilization, right? But moving around the borough, we really do come back to the way that North Central Brooklyn has incredible overutilization of its public schools, which means overcrowding, which means um, shifts in which students have to learn, which means stresses on the infrastructure, the buildings, the facilities, uh, and it means um, an under-resourced educational experience. Not enough books, not enough extracurricular activities, not enough enrichment space, in libra libraries, gymnasiums, and what have you. So the history of racial segregation throughout the city directly contributed to an unequal school system for Black, Hispanic. Back then, it was predominantly Puerto Rican and uh, white students in the 1960s. So activists at the time tried to concentrate on racial integration education as activism around a couple of very specific policy issues, zoning, teacher assignments, construction and capital improvements. I, I just got to pause and point this out. In, in Harlem, no, it's not Brooklyn. It's still important. 
in Harlem, there was only one high school and no school building constructions between World War 1940, right? So for, for, for 20 to 25 years, there was only one high school at the very moment when Harlem is becoming a magnet for hundreds of thousands of black people, there's one high school in that community and there's no new school construction. I mean, think about that for just a second. So integration means capital improvement. It means construction and it means access to uh, enrichment programs and facilities. And it also means um, partnership and respect of parents and, and teachers and students. And it means ending the double sessions that plagued the overcrowded schools like on the 1959 map. This is where I'm gonna end because we don't have a lot of time. I can talk if you're interested about the 64 boycott, but just keep in mind that the 64 boycott responded to these policy issues, histories, and patterns of inequality. At the time, people would talk a lot about discrimination outside of the US South, right? Discrimination in New York, being de facto, right? Not de jure. And again, that was a, a, a that was legalese, right? Like that was legal speak by saying de jure segregation was the type of segregation that they had in the South. It was segregation by law, right? De jure. De facto segregation is what you had outside of the South. What you had in New York City was de facto segregation, which means it was an accident, right? Like it wasn't through the law. It was just something that happened. It was a fact of life, right? But it wasn't legally created or sanctioned. So I'll end with one of my favorite intellectuals and the way that he distinguished between de facto and de jure segregation. This is James Baldwin. And James Baldwin said in 1965, de facto segregation means that Negroes are segregated, but nobody did it. And that was Baldwin's way of saying that this, this, that this is a distinction without a difference. And what you have in New York is you have an incredibly racially and class segregated education system, but you, and you have policies, you have very specific policies and practices that keep that system racially, racially segregated, but you have nobody taking responsibility for it to create actual solutions to deal with the problems that created the incredibly segregated public school system. So education as activism, these realities inspired Black New Yorkers and Black Brooklynites to protest, to raise awareness, to hold up a mirror to the city to say, New York City, you are not as liberal and cosmopolitan and accepting and inclusive as you say you are. New Black New Yorkers did that and their allies in the 1960s. They continue to do that. That I think we can learn from the past and looking at the present. There's a lot that's different about the past. We don't use the same language. We might not talk about the problem in the same way. Um, but there are many ways that the past can echo into our present and we can look at our present, uh, our present situations of the ways that racism persists and Brooklyn resists with lessons from the past in mind. Um, it's 440, I'll be quiet, we could talk, you could ask questions. I think I got like, what, maybe we got like five or 10 minutes to, to talk. If, there, if, the, if the audience has anything that, you know, on their mind, what do you think, Shirley? I think that was great. Um, and yes, if anyone does have a question, um, you please feel free to raise your hand or just write it in the chat. And we would love to be able to take your questions. Oh, I didn't see, you know, Katie, uh, Renee, thank you. I didn't see that. Um, you know, they, Katie and, and Renee were graciously given more time and I appreciate that, you know, but I'm, I, I wasn't reading the, the thing. But you know, let's use that time together. Let's use it together. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, first, does anyone have any questions?
why you're thinking, why you're thinking, because, you know, because I don't do well with silence. I'm a bad teacher. You know, teachers, you should be comfortable with silence. Good with it. The behind behind uh, Shirley is is the um, the the inimitable the 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 force that um, first uh, Congress representative from Central Brooklyn from Bedford Stuyvesant. Imagine that, right? Like Central Brooklyn, a community by 1965 of well over 300,000 people did not have a congressional representative. Um, until 1968, and the first congressional representative is um, behind Hi, Shirley, Shirley on our right, that's Shirley Chisholm. Um, and then next to her is uh, Elsie Richardson, a longtime community activist from Central Brooklyn who laid the foundations uh, for community development corporation work in from the late 60s uh, into the, the 70s and 80s. So I wanna you know, identify those two uh, heroines of, of Brooklyn's resist. And you know, they, we put them in the exhibit because they're both educators. They were both educators. Um, uh, Elsie Richardson worked as, you know, a parent. She was a volunteer. She was a school aide. She was on the PTA. Um, and Shirley Chisholm started her, before she got into politics, she was an elementary school teacher. Uh, I think she taught kindergarten and early childhood education and early childhood development. So those are two educators who were also um, activists. Uh, in that in that image, so. Mm -hmm. And I will say Shirley Chisholm is the one who made me like my name, because I always hated being called Shirley until I learned about her. And the fact that she also was here in Brooklyn makes me even more special for me. Okay. If you'd like to hold your questions till later, that'll be great. Oh, I no, we got somebody. We got... Uh, um... Um, yeah. Oh. Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Go ahead. It's Chamaze Arnold from Cameroon, history, high school history teacher from Cameroon. Yes, it's interesting. Uh, it's been a very wonderful presentation on uh, education as activism. And uh, I just wish to understand in this case, education as activism, is it kind of educators acting as activists or the curriculum or programs of study could also be agencies for activism. Yes. And actually, if, if I could just add to that question too, Brian, if part of that, the agency is, um, could you speak a little bit to the way young people themselves, not just the educators were on the ground helping to organize you know, these actions mm. that it's the young people and educators as actors. That's, those are fantastic questions, uh, both. Thank you. Um, the first question was about um, a distinction between, uh, you know, the, 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 the education as activism. So I mentioned that um, there's the act of education and then there's the schools themselves. But the first questioner, and thank you so much for that, also raised the important issue of the work of teachers and the work of curriculum, right? The work of curriculum development. Um, I think I understood the question correctly. Is that is that what you were speaking about? And and that's yes, so yes. that's so important over the long span of history. Um, we can look at some examples from the 1800s where the curriculum, the curriculum that was an activist curriculum for Black people in Brooklyn was a literacy curriculum, right? It was a question to teach people very shortly removed from histories of slavery or to teach people who had been uh, denied education and literacy to emphasize the curriculum of learning to read as a means of exercising power over their economic lives, to be able to read labor contracts and as a means of gaining uh, citizenship and power and equality in the public realm through literacy. Now that was the 19th century. What we see in the, I spoke mostly about the, the early 1960s and the curriculum around um, activism at that time really concentrates on this issue of what Milton Galamison was talking about of having an, an, a, a, a curriculum that was, was equitable. 
there was constant attention in the integration movement or the desegregation movement to have African-American students be able to access the high education, the academic track education in New York City public schools. One of the things that was happening in the 50s and the 60s is that black students were not being put on the high academic tracks. They were not being uh, encouraged to go to college. They were not attending the academically advanced high schools. They were mostly funneled into vocational schools, which listen, there's longer conversations about the value of vocational education, right? Like both of my parents went to New York City uh, vocational technical high schools, right? Like it's not about, you know, academic being better and vocational not being good, right? Forget about that. What it's about though, was that in the early 1960s, the curriculum activism was saying like, time out, like you're not even letting our children thrive to the degree that they could get into the college bound track. Like you already got them on one story, right? So the curriculum education in the, in the desegregation movement, it was about a curriculum of equity. Now to the, to, the, to the question's really good point about how curriculums can be activist curriculums. And I think my, my, my colleagues uh, who will speak next will speak much more to this than I can. Um, what we see, what I love in, in, in the late 60s, right? Uh, with the black power movement, like you really get to see African-American parents, students and educators starting to say like, we want African-American history. We want African-American literature. We want African-American culture, dance, music, art, plays. And in the late 1960s, they did this within the context of consciousness raising, right? Like this was the time when the activist curriculum was going to teach black children about themselves in a way that a segregated, racially discriminatory system did not. Now, if you look at the late 60s and the Black Power Movement, what's fascinating is a lot of the things that they were talking about and advocating for, African-American history, histories of discrimination and oppression, um, emphasis on culture, uh, are the same things that people are talking about now with diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right, same song, different tune, right? And 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 it's enriching everybody. So I think that that's one way to think about how curriculums themselves can be activist tools. Um, but I gotta admit, you know, until the until you asked that really good question, uh, that that was not completely what we emphasized in the exhibit. Um, but I think you could find ways to 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 draw that out with your students, and I hope you do. Now to the second question about what young people did, uh, young people are constantly involved in activism. It's amazing to see uh, young people in the early 1960s were deeply involved in the civil rights movement, in the integration movement or the desegregation movement. They're planning protests in their high schools. They're raising awareness about uh, nuclear power. That was a real big issue for um, high school students in Brooklyn in the early 60s. They were really concerned about the threat of nuclear annihilation. And around racism and equity, black students are helping to plan this boycott. Remember that, 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 that 400,000 number about that boycott that happens in 1964, that's all students, right? I mean, yes, through the encouragement of their parents, of their pastors, and activists, but but that was largely a student um, fueled movement. Both care about students, and students were the ones who participated in it. Now, later in the 1960s, you see a lot of students become involved in more of the Black Power organizing around curriculum development, pushing for African American history, and you see that at all levels, from high school, middle school, high school, and up to what black students are doing in colleges. So students and young people are deeply involved in this activism as they are today. Uh, so, um, 
or was the NAACP on this issue? Now, that's a good question, uh, and I'll answer it briefly. Um, the NAACP was slow, <laughs> slow to get involved in Northern racism, right? Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to make too many assumptions about the person who asked the question, but the history of the NAACP was to fight against that de jure segregation, right? That was their whole program to, to end segregation by changing the law. That's why that's the organization that got us the Brown decision. And waging a legal battle against racial segregation in New York City was very, very tricky, right? Because you could not prove that the schools were racially segregated because of a direct unconstitutional legal practice, right? Because of an unconstitutional law on the books. So, the NAACP is way behind on issues of Northern racism and the activist groups, the one that you'll see in the exhibit, the one that I write about is called CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. That's an activist group. Um, they're at the front uh, in the North. So thank you, that's a great question. Thank you, Brian. Again, the, 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 the hook, you know, but listen, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna send some things to Shirley and Shirley, you can send it to the participants. Yes. All right. Thank Definitely. you for those questions and your attention. And uh, I really appreciate everybody's generosity of spirit. I hope you continue to stay healthy. Uh, and I hope we see each other in person one day. Thank you, Dr. Cornell. That was so wonderful. Thank you very much. I do appreciate you being here. Um, next up, we have Katie Leo and Renee Halston from Facing History. Ladies. Thanks, Shirley. And thank you so much, Dr. Purnell, for that um, amazing lecture. I wish we could just continue to listen to you, um, but Renee and I have some, some things um, to share as well. But, but that, I think that was a great sort of lead in to, to what we have planned. Um, to talk to you all about this afternoon. So um, as Shirley said, Renee and I are from an organization called Facing History and Ourselves. Um, so I'd love to get us started just thinking about this idea of resistance and thinking about what are some issues you are involved in actively resisting? So there are gonna be two ways you can kind of participate in this poll once my screen feels like cooperating. There we go. Um, one way is you can hold your phone up to that QR code and try and take a picture of it on your screen. Um, and a little uh, voting link will sort of pop up. You can vote up to three times. Um, and you can also use the link that Renee put in the chat. And then I'm gonna show us the results of this poll. So what are some issues you are actively involved in resisting? If you didn't get the QR code, you can use the link in the chat that Renee just posted for us. The drama of waiting. Here we go. Here we go. All right. So this is going to be a word cloud. So if anyone happens to say the same thing as you, you're going to see some of those words start to change shape and, and uh, show up a little bit bigger. Um, but a lot of different things here. Wonderful. Thanks for putting it in the chat, Barbara. That works too. Great. So we see climate change and education sort of starting to pop up there as a little bigger. Again, you can do vote up to three times. So feel free to add uh, a number of different ideas to our, to our question here. Great. I see a lot of things that are related to each other. A lot of things that impact students who are sitting in our classrooms, if you happen to be involved in education. Great, thank you all so much for that. So I want us to just sort of sit with this for a minute, right? Lots of things happening on here, really big. We're seeing racism. I also saw white supremacy somewhere 
uh, coming up on here, racial equity, implicit bias, systemic racism. We also see climate change and we see education showing up as sort of larger issues. I wonder um, if your students were to answer this question, uh, how might that change? If you don't know any students, um, think of a, of a young person in your life. Oopsie daisies, sorry. Come back to the screen, here we go. You can put that in the chat or because we're a small group, you can also feel free to unmute and share if you feel like getting your, getting your voice out there. So how might a young person in your life or student in your classroom answer that question? What are some issues they're involved in actively resisting? Oh, thanks, Melinda. That's a great one, period stigma. Disability rights, implicit bias. Great, so a few that sort of weren't, didn't come up on our um, map there. Anything else? Oh, thank you. Food insecurity, counselors not cops from our Black Lives Matter sort of campaign there. Food, COVID vaccine mandates. Mm, far ahead of adults on climate emergency, marginalization, access to tech. Great, thank you. So maybe they might answer this a little bit differently than we answered it. Um, when we're thinking about um, youth getting involved in or their active uh, resistance, what are some things that you think they should consider when being involved in resistance as young people, right? That might look a little different than if we were asking this question for adults, but what are some things you think young people need to consider when being involved in active resistance that might be a little bit different than adults? Sort of looking at this bottom question here. Anything we'd want them to consider or keep in mind? Ooh, media literacy, great, thank you. It's a great long-term effects, thank you. Great question, who their audience is. Great, and so this is sort of the ultimate goal, great. So lots of great questions to consider, and this is what we're gonna sort of spend the rest of our time thinking about called the 10 questions for young change makers. But before we get to that, I'm gonna tell you really briefly about who we are um, and what we do. So uh, here's our mission statement here from Facing History. Uh, Facing History and Ourselves uses lessons of history to challenge teachers and students to stand up to bigotry and hate. So um, as an organization, we believe that the bigotry and hate we witness today um, are legacies of the brutal injustices of the past. And so we really want our students to understand what was happening in the past so they can sort of understand how it's showing up to today. And we help students connect uh, choices made in the past to those that they're going to make in their own lives. And we do this uh, by looking at a number of different case studies and topics throughout history. So democracy, looking at race, the United States, anti-Semitism and religious intolerance, bullying, global immigration, genocide. Um, and, and so, you know, these topics can be really difficult moments to explore with students who are sort of going into the heart of human darkness in a lot of these uh, in a lot of these topics, but we bring these topics to our students in a special way because we don't want them to leave our classrooms feeling disempowered. We want quite the opposite. We want them to feel ready to go out and exercise their civic agency and their civic muscles. And so this is sort of our, our scope and sequence of how we bring these topics to our students. We spend a lot of time talking about their own identities right here in the individual and society. So how do the choices that they are, how, how do others see them and how does that impact the choices that they're making. We help them understand this idea of we and they or membership and belonging. Uh, what are some groups they belong to, but when does sometimes group membership uh, have the opposite impact of inclusion? Groups and what are, what's the result of that? Then we get into our case studies. Um, after that, we're looking at how do we remember or in many cases misremember those histories and how does that not quite remembering what really happened impact what, what's happening now? So we're sort, sort of seeing that with the Confederate monument debate, right? What are we not understanding about the Civil War or about Reconstruction that we're seeing show up today in 2021? And this is where we're gonna be focusing today, this choosing to participate. So we really want our students leaving thinking, okay, now I've just 
thought a lot about my identity, the choices I'm making, the choices people have made in the past. And now what do I want to do with that information, right? How do I want to try and impact um, the world around me? So that's what we're going to sort of help you think about a little bit today. So lots of conventional approaches to teaching civics and democratic participation to students often begin with things like these are the branches of government or this is how a bill becomes a law and those are important things for our students to to know but sometimes that approach can feel really distant to students and like it's not it, it's meaningless it doesn't make any sense in their own lives um, and it can fail to engage them but we know right from Dr. Purnell's presentation and from our own lives and our own work with students and young people that they are actively involved in resistance and they have been throughout history so there are things that they are passionate about so how can we sort of engage them in civics um, and democratic participation by first starting with themselves um, their own interests and what they're passionate about so what we did was um and sort of created this four lesson unit based on this framework um, called 10 questions for young change makers. And so we're gonna look at that right now. So uh, if, if we had time, I'd have one of you read this, but I'll just read it. So uh, here's a little explanation of where these 10 questions come from and what they do. So in partnership with the MacArthur Research Network on Youth and Participation, politics, Harvard professor Daniel Allen developed a framework for civic participation called the 10 questions for young change makers. Rather than a to-do list, the 10 questions framework asks students to respond to a series of open-ended questions geared toward become smarter about the best use of digital tools and platforms. By proposing a method of reflection rather than a specific course of action, the framework cultivates in students the capacity to adjust and pivot as circumstances change, which they always do. So again, this framework that you're going to see really starts um, with students and being was asking the question of students, what do you care about? And why does it matter to you? And so that's sort of where our, our unit starts. I'm gonna show you a really brief overview of what's in the unit. So um, it's a series, like I said, of four ready to go lessons. The first lesson we're sort of gonna to demo today of thinking about what's in these 10 questions, how can I use them in the classroom? And then you'll see you can apply them to moments in history. So Dr. Purnell showed us um, a little bit about the school boycott in New York City in 1964, but there was also a school boycott in 1963 in Chicago. So we're gonna think a little bit about that and how we can apply the 10 questions, not only to things that are happening in your students' own lives right now, with the issues they're involved in resisting, but also how we can apply them to the past. Again, really helping um, sort of activate that student engagement and student interest. So Renee is going to put a link to these 10 questions for young change makers, this great infographic in the chat so that you can open it up on your own computer and see it a little bit uh, larger than you see it on my own screen here. And I'm going to give you five minutes, uh, three minutes to explore this infographic on your own. And as you do, I want you to uh, put in the chat what words or phrases catch your attention from this uh, infographic, these 10 questions. I'm going to give you three minutes. I'll be quiet as you scroll through. And then as you're doing it, uh, phrases and words that are catching your attention, put those in the chat. All right, take one more minute and then we'll start populating the chat with words or phrases that catch our attention. <laughs> 
All right, I'm starting to see some things pop up in the chat here. Um, how do I get from voice to change? Um, how do I make it about more than myself getting more than one shout out? Right, thinking about ways to engage, connect, both the wisdom and the downside that can be associated with crowds. What I particularly like is um, if you look up here and you see these three tiny graphics, each one of those sort of stands for a different thing that they want, theme that they want students thinking about. So equitable participation, effective participation, and then self-protective participation. And then you see each one of the questions is sort of coded to which one of those themes it's thinking, it's sort of prompting students to think about for, um, within that question. So I think that that's really smart too. Great, some more shout outs for the downsides of crowds. Wonderful. So now that we've spent some time thinking about this on our own, uh, we're gonna send you into breakouts um, for a brief eight minutes, just to sort of see someone else chat with a few other people and um, respond to one of these two questions. How can these questions provide students with the tools to examine what they care about and how to get involved in that issue? And how and when might you use these in a classroom if you happen to be a classroom teacher? Um, so those are our two questions. Um, Charlie's gonna put you into breakouts. Um, always good to start with your name uh, and then uh, we'll see you back here soon. Questions are in the chat. Thanks, Renee. All right. If you happen to be there, look around. You might have gotten a little tiny prompt asking you to join a breakout room. If you didn't receive that, feel free to chat us. Ah, oh, thanks for broadcasting that, uh, Charlie. Julia, Marianne, Sherry, you having trouble finding where you need to go? Maybe they stepped away. So Katie, were you thinking um, back at 5.15 or something? I did not do that math correctly. Um, could we bring them back at 5.13? I know that's like awfully specific. Um, no, yeah. <laughs> they also feel like it's uh, like a not not a super chatty group so maybe they won't have so much to share in their breakouts exactly. yeah that i think i think the risk is going too long for sure. yeah 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 okay sounds good yeah thank you so much yeah i'll, I'll give them like a three minute warning Um, Renee, when folks get back in three minutes, do you want me to debrief that or do you just want to start and jump in? I don't think we have time. I don't think we have time for a debrief. I'm not yeah. even sure we have time for 
I just texted you the video. I mean, and, and we we really like you can go towards close to five thirty if you need to. Um, don't think of five twenty five as like a hard stop, but I know that's still not a lot. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you. you know, we I think we had I think we had thought twelve, so they're coming back at five thirteen. So I think I think we can do the video if you think we do the video, but I leave it up to you. Okay. We'll do it. It'll, it's, it'll be nice for them to see. Yeah. They are coming back. We'll just wait an additional 30 seconds for everyone to join us, then we'll get started again. All right. Thanks for rejoining us. We hope that those conversations were generative and that it was nice to get to chat with someone else. Um, I am going to pass it over to my colleague, Renee Harleston, and she's going to sort of take those questions and show us what they look like when attached to a deep dive into a moment in history. All right, let me figure out how to unmute myself. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> Um, so yes, as Katie said, we hope that gave you some time to talk about how this, how students can use the 10 questions to examine their communities right now. Um, but at Facing History and Ourselves, it's really part of our mission to help students understand the world around them by examining lessons from history, right? Uh, and what's great about the 10 questions, um, sorry, I have some boxes in the way, you know how Zoom goes, I'm trying to move them out so I can see everyone, right? What's great about the uh, 10 questions is we can have students um, use them to examine um, the past, right? To examine the histories like Dr. Purnell talked about with the New York City um, school boycott, right? So I'm going to take you through a facing history resource to show you an example of how you can use the 10 questions in your history classrooms, right? When we did that poll earlier, we saw there were a lot of history teachers here, right? So how do you bring this into your curriculum um, and use stories of the past? So facing history has a unit in those in these 10 questions framework unit about the 1963 Chicago public schools boycott. Um, and even though, like I said, we're this unit really focuses in on Chicago, you can we'll show you um, a tool to apply this to other histories as well. Right? Um, so one thing you'll see in every facing history lesson is we start off with some essential questions, right? And the essential questions um, 
that were are for this lesson are what does success mean in the context of social change, right? And how should we assess the impact of change making efforts, right? So some of the things that you brought up when Katie asked, what do you want your students to consider, right? Um, what should they be thinking about in terms of, of their um, 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 decision to, to resist? So just to give us a little bit of context to make sure we're all on the same page, we are going to be talking about this history. Of course, I want us to all know what history we're talking about. Um, so in the 1963 Chicago public schools boycott was six years after the Brown versus Board of Education decision um, declaring um, school segregation to be unconstitutional. Um, but similar to what Dr. Purnell was talking about in Brooklyn, right, we know redlining was happening all over the country, including Chicago and many other factors that created racially segregated schools, right, this de facto segregation. So um, in October of 1963, actually the anniversary is coming up soon, um, over 200,000 students boycotted Chicago's uh, Chicago public schools to protest racial segregation and unequal conditions in white and black schools. Many of the students marched through the city calling for the resignation of school superintendent Benjamin Willis. Um, and in our lesson, we also have a video that was taken um, from that day. They called it Freedom Day. Um, the video is three minutes long, and I just want you to get a, a look at it um, to help also bring in a little bit more context. So here is the video. I'm going to just make sure we can all see it and hear it. Go. Why are you out of school today? Because today is Freedom Day. Why am I? Because I want to march for my freedom rights. You gonna march? No, I'm not gonna march. <laughs> what do you if do I don't go to school, school, I'm gonna march. Yeah, me too. Some uh, teachers have been saying that if you uh, stay out of school today, then they are, you know, give you D's, they'll fail you for the day. I don't think they have any uh, right to do this. And I'm not afraid of them myself, but they don't threaten me. Oh, in Ukraine, it's highly most students there at all. We got a population in Ukraine about 3,500, not even 100 kids there. Uh, I wish there wasn't nobody in school. I wish the whole school was empty. education and I think that we have should have as much freedom as any other citizen of the United States. We as parents, I think we could do a great help if we walk in this freedom mind. Well, I think this is one of the most wonderful demonstrations and stabs for freedom that the Negro in Chicago has ever had. Uh, we are definitely interested in the education of our children. We want quality in education, and this is the main reason why we're marching today. The books we get, they aren't new books, they are secondhand books. And some of the teachers have explained it to us, and we don't have enough books to go around to each student, so we have to share books. So what's your name? Ralph Davis. Ralph Davis, and what yes. school do you go to? Uh, Waller right now. Waller? What about Waller school? Well, right now, it's in pretty bad shape. Why is it in bad shape? It's crowded. They got, you know, mobile school. Do you feel personally you're not getting the education that personally, you're Personally, I feel that way. Yeah. I'm not getting what I should. Because yeah. somebody is sharing what I should have all for myself. I'm very glad to see that it's such a good turnout. I'm very much in favor of integration, and I'm sorry that um, Mr. Willis hasn't done more about it. Go, go, Willis, go, no, go, 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 So um, we know that, you know, even though today this protest is not 
very well known. It was definitely a big news event at the time, right? Even Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. met with organizers and encouraged them to protest the inequality in their schools. Um, and we're kind of going back and thinking of the essential questions that I showed earlier, right? This lesson of the 63 Chicago Freedom Day helps students think about and um, how to define success uh, for large scale movements, right? Because we know that segregation um, and, and unequal schools are still a thing all over the country, um, including in New York, right? Um, and although we're not going to talk about New York City Freedom Day that Dr. Purnell mentioned earlier, um, it is a really great example to use in your classroom with the 10 questions framework for the past um, that I'm going to show you. Um, and Katie um, put in the chat here, the 10 questions framework for the past. So we've adapted those questions that Katie went through earlier to the five most applicable to help students sort of think critically about um, change making events like Freedom Day. Um, so just take three minutes, take a look at these questions, see what you're noticing, right? How is it different than the 10 questions Katie showed you? So make some notes for yourself on how you could use this uh, in your classroom as a history teacher or any kind of um, educator. All right, I hope those few minutes gave you a good chance to just look over the questions, think about what those might, how you might apply those um, to your history class um, and thinking about and helping your students think about um, resistance in the past, resistance today, um, and how they might want to think about bringing some resistance into their civic agency. Um, um, don't think we quite have time for this one. I do want to point out that in the booklet that um, um, the Brooklyn Center for History shared earlier, we do have links to our resources, uh, links to how you can work with us, including our upcoming professional learning events. Um, and you can also stay in touch with us using the email address that you see on your screen there. And Katie also just put in the chat the access to the four unit lesson that we talked about. Right. Uh, before I pass it over to um, back to Shirley, any last minute questions or thoughts that you want to bring bring up in the chat about what Katie and I spoke about? Okay. Thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. That was a really good workshop. I really enjoyed that. And thank you, Brian. Um, so I'd like to, first of all, I'd like to thank Katie, Brian, and Renee for coming and participating with us.
Um, I really am appreciative for all the hard work that you've done and for being here with us. Um, and also for taking the time to join us for the first in our series on Brooklyn Resist. If you enjoyed today's session, we hope you'll consider joining us for future education workshops at the Center for Brooklyn's History. Um, we will be doing um, two more Brooklyn Resist workshops in 2022 in February and April. Um, however, from um, November through January will be our three-part series on Muslims in Brooklyn. And the first one will take place on November 17th. If you're looking for a way to virtually support project-based learning and research in your classrooms during it at all, consider New York City History Day. Consider having your students participate this year. The, Brooklyn, the Center for Brooklyn History is proud to host this year's virtual contest. And we're, partner, we're actually partnering with cultural institutions around the city and state to support students and educators who are interested in participating in the nation's biggest history competition. This year, New York City contest is free and open to all sixth through 12th grade students. Registration will open on January 24th. However, when you do register, you have to have your project ready and be ready to upload please feel free to go to our website, um, as you see here on the page, or email us for more information. Finally, I'd like to conclude with an urgent request to fill out a short survey about your experience attending today's event. As we navigate this new virtual world, I can say your feedback will directly impact the way we offer future PLs. Also, the survey is also your key to your CTLE credit. Those seeking credit will receive an option at the end of the survey to enter their details for this purpose. Only those that fill out the survey will receive credit. I repeat, only those that fill out the survey will receive the CTLE credit. Those that, re those that request should keep their eyes peeled for a digital confirmation of your CTLE credit within the next week. On behalf of Brooklyn Public Library Center for Brooklyn History's Education Department, I would like to thank you again for attending and we hope to see you soon. Thank you.